Okay, here's a quick review. Yes, the train car collapsed. We changed the pressure inside. We can't change the atmospheric pressure, but we can just put hot water in the train, seal it off, and then uh, as it cools quickly, like maybe hosing it down with cold water, the water vapor inside turns back to liquid, leaving behind a lower pressure than air pressure, and the train collapses. So here's our atmospheric pressure. When you are at sea level, you have the whole column of air, which call, is called the atmosphere over you. Here it is again. Notice all the dots down here. It's really heavy. When you climb up the mountain, the column is smaller, so there's less air up there, including oxygen, which is what you notice physiologically. This is a barometer. It measures room pressure. You overturn a full column of mercury. You fill it up and overturn it into a dish of mercury, and it falls only 760 millimeters, because this is calibrated, when you're at sea level. It would be different if you were at other altitudes. And it doesn't continue to flow out because air pressure is now holding it up. And so we can say the air pressure is this measurement. This looks like a distance measurement, but it's actually a force measurement when it's millimeters of mercury. It's got to be mercury. Arian, right, you had a question? How does air pressure exactly hold it up? Well, it, like, let me go back to this one. This one's better. So these are all the gas particles, right? They're being pulled down because they have matter. They're matter. They have mass. They're being pulled down by gravity. Well, just as though you were, if you dive into a pool, you can feel the pressure of the water over you, or you buried underneath a mattress, you can feel the pressure on top of you. It's the same. It's just less pressure than that. And also, we evolved in this environment, and our bodies kind of push back with an equivalent pressure. In other words, air pressure isn't crushing us down, right? So that means our, body, our bodies are pushing back with an equivalent pressure. So we can't really feel this, but you can sure feel it when it goes away. When you walk up a mountain, there's just much less oxygen, and you feel that physiologically. Uh-huh, Ash? Is air pressure like, stronger than water pressure, like liquid? Well, gas particles are really less dense, right? So for the same volume, volume per volume, like if you look at this room, if we filled this room with water, that would be a lot more mass. It's a function of mass. So it's more pressure with gas, but more volume. No, not more. No, if you had an equivalent volume of water and gas, uh -huh. the water would weigh more because there's more particles. Yeah. Because they're like this, right? It's less. It's more dense. Yeah. Versus this. Come on. So as you go up, like in the next slide. Uh huh. Um, go up. Like as in like height. Like say you're on the mountain. That's how the mountain. Mm. So then the these arrows get smaller. Right. So then there'll be less of uh, millimeter. That's right. So maybe it's only, I don't know, 550 if you're way up high. The other thing you'll notice is that bo water boils differently. We'll talk about that with the next chapter. If any of you have ever lived in a higher altitude, has anybody done that? If you bake on the side of the container, like a cake recipe, it'll say high altitude directions. Anybody bake and see that? You have to change things a little bit when you're at a higher altitude because the water boils at a different temperature than 100 degrees. We'll get to that soon. So barometer, pretty simple. I, I will confess to you that I just look it up. When I need the barometric pressure, I just look it up. Singapore doesn't change much anyway. I just look it up. This is the one you got to know. I don't have an image when they're equal. So if, let's just pretend, air pressure is one atmosphere. We pump in one atmosphere. What would this column of mercury do? They would be identical. There's no H. So in other words, P of the gas, pressure of the gas, equals the atmospheric pressure because H is zero. Now, if we um, pump some out, so now the pressure in here is less than the pressure here, or if you prefer to think of it that way, this is a greater pressure, it's pushing the mercury up this way, then the atmospheric, I'm sorry, the difference in the pressure is H, and the P in here is atmospheric minus H. This one's less. You all can see that conceptually, right? That this is less. You can think of it as sucking it towards it, so it's lower than the air pressure. So we subtract H. And then the reverse is true for this one. We pump more gas inside here. It pushes the mercury up. H, yes, that's a millimeter measurement, but it's millimeters of mercury, so it's a force measurement. And now this pressure of the atmosphere, whatever it is, the pressure of the gas is the atmospheric pressure plus H. It's able to push against atmospheric pressure, so it's greater than, and it's greater by the value H. It's really easy to read that right off the manometer. Here's the easy one. Uh, these were open. This one's closed. So you just read it right off. What The pressure of the gas is whatever the H is. So it's pretty easy to tell what the gas pressure is. 
We did this all with marshmallows and balloons and a syringe. Pressure and volume are the only ones where one goes up and the other goes down. So this is the syringe one. And my syringe is now really sticky. I washed it and I got to find a lubricant and I can hardly do it anymore. But when you hold your finger over the end and trap the gas inside, the temperature is 25. The amount of gas, the moles, is constant because you trap it. When you push down on the syringe, the volume goes down and the pressure goes up. So that's the inversely proportional one. This is called Boyle's Law. Oh, let me just, uh, here's our first condition. I did 100 mils with one atmosphere and then I reduced the volume to 50 mils. So this doubled. I reduced this by half, so this doubled, two atmospheres. So our first set of conditions are the one, and the second set are two. That's important to know. There's a change of conditions. But Rahul and Aryan, you need to be paying attention here. That's Boyle's Law. Uh, Lord Kelvin came, and that's why they're called Kelvin degrees, um, named in his honor. This guy, uh, Thompson, figured out that there's probably a temperature at which uh, the gas the gas's volume would be zero, and that's called absolute zero. So uh, we've got to measure from now on, our gas temperature has always got to be in Kelvin, and all you do is add Celsius plus 273, and that's on your equation sheet. You don't even have to memorize that. On the equation sheet where it says gases, up on the top left, eh, somewhere over here, Fifth from the top? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there it is. K equals C, degrees C plus 273. So you don't even have to memorize that, but by after about four problems, you'll know it. So this is our marshmallow. We increased the temperature, and the marshmallow got bigger. So one goes up, the other one up. So again, we have two conditions. Marshmallow at its small, you know, its normal little state. At room temperature, we stuck it in the microwave, heated it up, and they got really big. So V goes up, T goes up, or T goes up, V goes up. That's called Charles's Law. So two separate conditions. That's what you're going to look for when you work, work problems. Here's another example of Charles' Law, the marshmallows. This one is what happens when you throw the um, sealed can in a fire. The temperature goes up and the pressure goes up. And if there's a, a weak spot in the can, it blows up. So the same analysis. Here's the room temperature, the normal pressure. Then you throw it in the fire, it heats up, and bloom. That is called gay lussacs Law. Here it is. Pretend there's no bullet. I couldn't find a picture of an exploding can, so. Um, this is the one, somebody blew up the balloon for me. This is the one Rahul demonstrated. The balloon, he put in moles of gas and the volume changed. Now the only way that happens is when the container is elastic, or it'll say flexible. If it says rigid, we're back to this one. Oh, wait, no, sorry, I don't have that one. That's temperature. Um, when we're pumping in, like, filling up a bicycle tire or a volleyball or whatever, or filling up a balloon, when you add more gas molecules, the volume will change if the container is flexible. This is called Avogadro's Law. And by the way, just as before, we have two separate conditions. Here's the balloon when it's empty or mostly empty. It just has room air in it, whatever volume it is. Then we start adding more and it gets bigger. So that one also is directly proportional. This uh, Avogadro also figured out Avogadro also figured out that, this is weird, all gases take up the same volume if you have one mole. So here's a gas. We'll pretend that this is a gas. Some incredibly big gas, but it's still a gas, so it's moving really fast through the room. And maybe we have argon, just an atom. We'll pick a smaller one. Helium, just an atom. How can one mole of each of these take up the same volume? This is so much bigger. But yet, when you look at the data, they're almost identical. Yeah, there's a, you know, a third sig fig here, but it's still really close. But if you think about the size of the gas molecules, this compared to the room, that's not to scale. A gas particle is really tiny, you know, even smaller than this compared to the room. So the room volume is pretty, 22 liters is right there, that box. So the gas particles are so much smaller that their relative side doesn't really matter very much. That was where we left off the other day. That was a little review. This stands for kinetic molecular theory. So first of all, let's review states of matter. This is like eighth grade, right? Solids, definite shape, definite volume. Here's my desk, big rectangular prism, 
one meter by three meters by less than a meter, but let's say a meter. It's always going to be that shape and size, right? It's not going to get crushed by air pressure. If we change, you know, if a thunderstorm comes in, it's not going to change. Liquids have an indefinite shape. You can put them in a balloon and make them be any shape. You can spill it out on the water and it's a great big cylinder, but their volume is the same no matter what. Gases, indefinite shape, indefinite volume. They're moving really fast. And then I have, oh, lots of order for solids and they only vibrate. So here's our model for solids. They're vibrating. They're touching and they're vibrating. Uh, here's our model. Is it vibrating? Yeah, yeah really slowly. Uh, liquids are like this, so they're orderly but very short range, not, not very long term, not like a giant crystal, that would be this. They vibrate, so they go like that, they rotate, and they translate all at once. I can't do that, but there it is. Gases, they're all over the place, and they're much less dense. So, ask your question about the pressure. You can see this would have much more pressure. There's just so many more molecules. Um, Gases expand. You already saw that happen with the balloons and the marshmallows. They're fluid. They flow. Think um, steam is a gas. It can flow and it can turn a turbine and generate electricity. As we've already said, they're really low density. There's not very many of them at any given volume. Pressure. They exert pressure. And you can compress them. So if you've ever tried to squeeze down a balloon, you can, if you get your hands around it, you can squeeze it. You can squeeze gases down. It's because there's so much space between the particles. This other thing, this idea of pressure, here's pressure. This works for AP chem. This works for university chem. Here's a, a gas molecule. It hits the wall. That is the pressure. So if there's a bunch of them, they're hitting the wall. If there's only a few, they're hardly hitting the wall. The pressure went down. So the more particles that you have hitting the wall, the higher the pressure. Diffuse, that's Graham's law, we'll talk about that, and effuse. So diffuse, diffuse means when the particles move towards you. So for example, when I turn on this candle, when I light the candle, or when these start to rot, the flowers start to rot and I rinse them out. You guys are going to smell that first. Finally, Adi and Rahul will start to smell it. You guys maybe not because of the air con. You guys maybe not. So that is diffusion of gas particles. Effusion is when there's a hole in the container and the, something leaks out. So I don't know if you've ever walked by Mr. Price's room when he's burning his chocolate candles. Have you guys ever walked by there and smelled the chocolate? Oh, it's from kids opening up the door. They open the door. There's a hole in the door, an exit, and the gas the smell molecules of chocolate come out. So that's effusion. Gas particles defuse because they're moving really fast. They effuse if there's a hole. So they're moving around, they hit the wall, and there happens to be a doorway there. So they effuse out. That's Graham's law. Mm -hmm. So like, could you say, like, if a flower rotted? If a flower rotted? Uh, it would, like, the smell of it would diffuse, but then it could also effuse if the door was open. So uh, well, this is diffusion. It's just moving through the room. Effusion is through a hole. It exits. That's what so they like use. So, like the particles diffuse, right? And then also effuse. Possibly, if they run into the wall. If you have enough of them, I don't think you've ever walked in and gone, "Ooh, it smells like rotten flowers in here." But I will, I will walk by Adrian's room and smell chocolate sometimes because <laughs> he burns them all day long. And the chocolate one, I just happened to notice. All of this is because of the kinetic molecular theory, which just means that particles move. And the particles we're talking about are generally molecules, but yeah, we do have some atom gases. Like in the noble gases, they're all atoms. They're not molecules. The rest of them are all molecules, though, like horses need oats for clear brown irises. Um, this is really a great model. Um, it defines, it'll give us uh, volume, pressure, and temperature info. We can predict how things uh, act. And here's an important point, it's only for ideal gases. But guess what? All our gases are ideal. So yay. Uh, yeah, and it, it's an imaginary gas, but all our gases are ideal. Even for AP chemistry, pretty much all our gases act ideally. So here's KMT. First of all, they are discrete particles, but they have no volume. Why do we care if they have no volume? Well, remember, even this size particle compared to the room, this has volume. So imagine the pencil lead. Remember I had the pencil lead, which has disappeared. The tip of a pencil lead could be a gas particle compared to this room. Well, that's a negligible volume. 
So we don't even consider the volume of the gas particles themselves. That makes it easier. They're really far apart. They're really, really small. And another thing that we believe for KMT is that they don't attract. Now, we just talked about a gas that attracts. What was it? Water, water vapor. We always have to say water vapor. So gaseous water does attract. But for KMT in our ideal gas law, we assume that they're just zipping by each other with no attractive force. Now, when would they start to attract? Uh, why would it condense? Sorry? The temperature goes down. So here's our gas model. Really hot, right? 25 degrees. Well, 25 degrees isn't really boiling for water turning into gas. So 100 degrees, water, water vapor moving around really fast. You chill it down. They move slower, and then that attractive force can kick in. So you can already see that the ideal gas law works at really high temperatures. Most of the time, though, we're talking about really high temperatures. So always assume our gases are ideal unless I ask you a specific question like I just did. When would this gas not act ideally at low temperatures? Um, yeah, as it starts to get colder. Um, we don't care about the volume, so we just go with the container volume. So if we have a 750 mil bottle and we have only gas in here, then the volume of the gas is 750 mils. We don't subtract out the volume of the gas particles. That makes it easy because it'll always say a one liter container, a 500 liter container or whatever. It will always give you the volume. Um, we're assuming our, molar, our molecules are zero. Uh, they're constantly moving super fast because remember here solid really slowly, liquid, gas. They go straight until they hit a wall and then they bounce off. They uh, only collide with the walls and they don't lose any energy to the walls. So they just hit the wall, bounce right over, come back, hit the wall. It's forever. Here they are. They're just moving around inside the container. Okay. Uh, average kinetic energy, we already talked about this with Boltzmann distribution. Let's just blast through this math. We can just say the average kinetic energy is the temperature in Kelvin for gases. Got to change it to Kelvin. So let's say we have H2 and CO2. Do those react? We just have them like at room temperature. No, so it's just a mix of gases. They're all about the same temperature on average. And we're going to ignore this. Remember we talked about this with thermo? We said all particles exhibit this kind of behavior. So we've got some sample. Let's pretend this line here is 25 degrees. Let's do water first, 25 degree water. This axis is percent of particles. Here's 100. Almost all the particles are moving, kinetic energy, are moving at a temperature that would read on a thermometer 25C. So just room temperature water. But let's pretend that right there is the 100 degree mark. So that little tiny triangle is the vapor. So even in a sample of room temperature water, some of the particles, very, very few, less than 1%, are boiling. And so that means that there's a vapor, water vapor, above the sample. So even cold temperature water has a vapor. Now let's look at the other side. Even though the water sample is 25 degrees, there's a tiny fraction that are zero. So that means they are just about to go from gas to liquid. Whoops. They are very close. Oh, this was water. They are just about to freeze. Okay, so the water is 25 degrees. Over here, it's getting very close to zero. It's almost frozen. It's right above the freezing point. So that's in any 25 degree room temperature water sample. And this is true for all, all um, particles. So now let's do it with gases. Let's say it's 25 degrees. And then we add 273 to make it Kelvin because it's a gas, so 298. That means this is 298. Some of them are moving really, really fast, and some of them, a tiny fraction, are going so slowly they're almost becoming liquids. So they follow the same distribution. Now we heated up the gases in the marshmallow and the water. So when we do that, the whole thing gets shifted right. So now more particles are at this higher temperature. If this blue, uh, pink line was water, that's the boiling. Now more of them are boiling. That's what you guys saw when I boiled the Coke can of water. You saw the water vapor 
coming off because you can see the steam coming out of the, the hole in the Coke can. I was creating more vapor by heating up the sample. Now the average is like 50 degrees. And as it got closer to boiling, more and more of them were boiling away. This is a really good way to explain a lot of stuff about liquids and, and gases. So back to KMT, they're constantly moving. We, we say that their volume is zero. They don't have any attractive force in our ideal gases. And average kinetic energy is Kelvin temperature, but you've got to change it to Kelvin. First off, we're all going to end up messing that up and do it in C, and the answers don't come out right. Yeah, Ariane? What happens if like, two of the gases moving run into each other? Perfectly elastic collision. Yeah, it's just like billiards. Do you know billiards? It's exactly like that, except the walls of the billiards table is a little squishy, so some of the energy gets lost to that. In a container, they just hit the wall and come back off and hit each other. They just knock against each other. Now, when it's cold, then they could join up. Okay, if it's polar water, it could condense. Yeah, Zoya? Yeah, energy related to Because temperature goes up, P goes up. Whose law is that? Y'all supposed to answer one. Gay-Lussac's law. Temperature goes up, pressure goes up. So yeah, why? So Zoya, here's 25 degree gas. One, two, three. You heat them up. Now it's moving faster, so the pressure goes up. I mean, think of it that simple, you guys. Don't make it a more difficult concept. It's quite simple. Uh, okay, this is great then. So now here comes the math, everybody's favorite part. We need P, V, and T. On the other times we made measurements, we didn't need P, V, and T. Like my desk, my water, it kind of doesn't matter if the pressure in here is 750 or 760 torr the volume is not going to change. But for a gas, it changes. So we have to stipulate all four variables. And in most cases, what we care about and what we're looking for is moles, because we want to do stoichiometry. See how it all fits together? So here's the gas laws. There's four variables, pressure, volume, temperature, and moles, P, V, T, and N. Remember, P is just collisions. Just think of them as collisions of the particles. If the particle, sorry, if the walls of the container got smaller, what's going to happen? Second ladder? More pressure. So volume goes down, pressure goes up. That's Boyle's law. Uh, volume is just the size of the container. It will always say a one liter container or whatever. The temperature was always stipulated, but it's going to be in Celsius. We don't usually measure temperature in Kelvin. You've got to add the 273 to make it Kelvin. And then N, we need that for this, so that's almost always what we're solving for. Probably there's some homework problems where you're given N and you solve for these other things, but in real life, what we're looking for in most cases is N, so we can relate it to the rest of the um, stoic. Okay, let's look at pressure. Uh, there's lots of different units of pressure. You don't have to memorize them. You're welcome to look up the conversions. There's a few on here. <laughs> I know in WebAssign there's probably going to be turn kilopascals to something. Just look up the conversion. You don't have to memorize it. But a force is defined as one newton. That's a pressure unit. One newton on an area one square meter. That's one pascal. So we can use kilopascals. By the way, this is French for Système International. That's the International Union of Systems um, and Measurements. So we just say um, SI units. So kilopascals, but guess what? We almost never measure anything in kilopascals. I'll give it to you in millimeters or tor, and I don't know what happened there. That should be there. Come back to this power point. Remember doing the um, ideal gas law equation? That's only always if you use atmospheric mm -hmm. pressure. Oh, no, I'll show you that. There's a couple that are on our sheet, so we'll use those two. So you can see that there's um, that there's a couple that are on our sheet, so we'll use those two. So you guys, um, I almost always use one of these three. These are the same, remember? Tor in millimeters of mercury. So, oh, yeah, look, here's the conversions. I'll give them to you. And then standard pressures. Okay, we don't care about that now. All right, STP we've already got, zero degrees, and one, uh, one atmosphere, 760 millimeters. So here's our first law. Pressure goes up, volume goes down, or vice versa. Uh, this is our first set of conditions. So when you notice a change of conditions, it'll say, and then the volume was changed to, then you know you're using this law. So you'll be given the first set of conditions, and it'll say, then the volume was this, and then you solve that equation for P2. Real easy algebra. 
Charles's law is the same, only it's temperature and volume. So here's our first set, here's our marshmallow at room temperature, and then you change the temperature to, I don't know, 50 degrees Celsius. Don't forget to add 273. And then what's the new volume? You just solve that equation for V2. And then gay lussacs law, same. You heat up the container. Whoops, you have room temperature container and a certain pressure. You heat it up. What's the new temp uh, pressure? Real easy algebra. But look at this. Yeah, yeah, sure, go ahead. Well, I'm going to put them together on the next page, too. But go ahead. Oh, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to take some amount of gas in moles, and we're going to hold, uh, yeah, moles constant and P and V together. Well, we can take Boyle's law and Charles's law and Gay-Lussac's law and put them all together. We could also put Avogadro's in there as well. We could put an N down here. So P1, V1 over T1. Hey, guys. Hold on. This is the one that's not on the sheet. Equals P2, V2 over T2. And, yeah, we could put an N2 and, and an N1 down here because those are directly proportional. That's our balloon, blowing up the balloon with your mouth one. Well, what would happen if volume was constant to this equation? In other words, that is the same as that. P1. It's just P1 over T1 equals P2 over V2. So if no change in volume happened, you don't need the volume term. If the temperature stayed the same, we're back at P1 V1 equals P2 V2, Boyle's law. So the combined gas law, if, if multiple things change, you can do it all at once. You just got to make sure the units match. Don't do this. Pressure in kilopascals and pressure in atmospheres. Don't do that. And don't forget to change temperature to Kelvin, and it'll all work out. This is called the combined gas law. We should put an N there. Don't forget to change Kelvin. Anytime you read about a change in conditions is when you use this one. P1, T1, sorry, P1, V1 over T1, N1. Okay, so now we have one of our gas laws, real handy gas law. That one's the combined gas law. So here's an example of a problem. I won't make you do it right yet because you're going to work these problems in a minute. 750 mil, what's that? What's that a measure of? Volume. Was measured in the lab at room conditions. What's this a measure of? Pressure and, and what temperature are we really going to have? 298. Room temperature is 298K. What would be its volume at STP? So this is like a change of conditions. Instead of 740 and 298, it's got to be 0 and 760, which is one atmosphere. These are standard conditions. So you guys just take the time to lay out. Oh, sorry? Probably, yeah. <laughs> just take the time to lay out your variables because that way, it's just like in computer science, kind of declaring your variables. Otherwise, you might make a mistake with tor versus atmosphere. But remember, tor and millimeters of mercury are the same. And then you just write your equation. I highly recommend you write the equation and then solve for the variable. And then plug it all in. Hit the go button on your calculator. What's the last thing we always check for? Sig fig. So we've got two here. How many here? Two. two, so our answer can only have two. two. So it's not 6.70 times 10 to the 2, it's 670. And then don't forget the units, and then put, you should put a label here too. What are we talking about? Gas. Yes. <laughs> put a box around it for me so I can see the answer really quickly on a POD or a test. These are really easy. You won't have any trouble with them. Now I'm going to grab all these together, and this K... It's the KKK. <laughs> I'm going to give it a new name. We're just going to give it a new name, R. And that means we replace all of that with R and put that over here. And that's the ideal gas law. PV equals NRT. You don't have to memorize that. You're going to know it in a minute anyway. It's on our sheet. Now, Ar Ariane asked about um, a bunch of different gas pressure values, right, or units. Well, it depends on this R. There's two on our sheet. Can y'all find them? 
You make sure you can find them. They're right here. Gas constant. The first one is not the one we'll be using with this topic. Ash, can you find it? Right here in the second column. Gas constant R equals the first one's joules per k-mole. Not that one. The next one is 0.08206. I, I end up using 0821, but you can use 0806, four sig figs. Or the 62.36 liter tor. So one's in liter atmospheres and one's in liter tor. So whatever the problem gives you, just use that gas constant. Okay, when do we use this? When there's no change in conditions. What do you use when there's a change in conditions? What's this one called? Combined gas law. See how they're combined? That's probably why they named it combined gas law. So now we've got our ideal gas law. And in many cases, what we're finding is that. So that goes over here, you guys. Non-standard conditions. So now we have our other branch of our molar highway. So pretty much we're always finding moles, or then we not need to change it to grams. Uh, it depends on moles and grams. Molar mass or density is another part. So P in atmospheres, V in liters. N is the number of moles. R is the gas law constant. If this is going to be atmospheres and this is liters, then that R is 0.0821. And then T and Kelvin. Don't forget to change it to Kelvin. If you put the units for R, you might get your memory jogged when you write liter atmosphere over K, K mole. I'm hopeful that's what happens. If you write down liter, maybe you'll remember this has got to be a liter. Remember that problem was milliliters. It can't be in milliliters. And atmosphere, when you write down liter atmosphere, ATM, you'll remember to change it or use the other gas constant. Here's how we found that out. One atmosphere, one mole at 273, that's zero degrees. It's 22.4 liters. Remember that from earlier in the year. That's the 0.0821. If we do it in milliliters, 82.1. Here's the other one that's on our, spray, on our equation sheet. Tor, everything else is the same. Uh, there's four sig figs on our sheet, though, right? Doesn't it say 62.326? Yeah, slightly different. Woohoo! Ideal gas law. Here's how we work a problem. What mass of helium is required to fill a 1.5 liter balloon at STP? Okay, where, where's the moles? Nope. Oh, it is at STP. Where are we, get, where are we gonna get moles though? Find moles, turn it to mass, your answer will be mass in grams. Okay, so where would you start? Can't start at mass. Finding the number. Finding the number of moles. We've got liters, we've got volume, we've got pressure and temperature. We've got everything we need. So lay out your variables like this, it will help you. N is what we're looking for. There's no change in conditions. We're not heating anything up. So we use PV equals NRT. Set it up, solve for what you want. Plug, chug, there's our moles. But the answer asked for mass. So we're here. We went from here to here, now we need to go here. What's the molar mass of helium? You've got a periodic chart right in front of you. Four. Grams per mole. So remember back in the day we learned chapter one, how to lay these out? This is why, so we can do these stoichiometry and gas problems. By the way, how many sig figs? Two here and two there. So two there in our answer. Circle it. Put HE back there for me. I'll love you forever. All good? I have one more example. It's been a long time since you've done this, you guys. Oh, empirical formula. What was the relationship between the molecular formula and the empirical formula? There was a, a proportion was a factor of what we called the factor. So remember glucose, C6H12O6, and CH2O, what's the factor? 
Six. six. So the molar mass is six times the empirical formula mass. Quick refresher on empirical formula. A gas is only carbon and hydrogen. Oh, here's the empirical formula. Quick, what's the mass? Carbon is 12. Hydrogen is 1. No, we, we, we don't need those sig figs for this. It's going to be a rough, isn't it? Oh, 16.03. Uh, it's about 14. We don't need the point. We're just going to divide the empirical, I'm sorry, the molecular formula by empirical formula mass, so it's okay if it's not quite that precise. So empirical formula mass, about 14. The gas has a density, uh-oh, mass over liters. This is not in the ideal gas law, but I've got a way to rearrange it so we can get density. So we've got temperature, 273 plus 27, and 734 torr. What is the model mass? Okay, so first thing you got to do is lay out your variables. Don't forget to change that to Kelvin. We got everything in the right units now if we use the gas constant with the uh, tor. But look what I'm doing here. Now it's kind of fast and I, I can't edit this anymore because it's really old. Here's good old PV equals MR, NRT. And now I'm going to rewrite N a different way. I'm going to do it under here. What is mass divided by molecular mass, molar mass? What are the units of mass? And what are the units of molar mass? Grams over moles. So when you divide a fraction by another fraction, it's the same as multiplying by the inverse, right? Remember all that? So that means grams cancel, this moves to the top, that's moles. Woo! See what I did there? Let's do it again. Mass over molar mass is grams over grams per mole, the grams cancels, this moves to the numerator, it's moles. So I'm going to replace N in this law. I'm going to replace that with mass over molar mass. So I have PV equals mass over molar mass. I'm going to abbreviate it MM times RT. And now I'm going to put MM on here and PV on the other side. I guess I'm going to do it over here. Molar mass is we move that up there is equal to mass we still have r and t and we also have i'm going to move this to the denominator so p and v but i'm going to do it in the opposite fashion but multi multiplication is commutative so i can go pv or vp right so let me check to make sure everybody's followed the algebra that i did kushan just want to make sure you got this algebra it's algebra one or middle school algebra for some of you just a sec Let's do it again. Moles is the same as mass over molar mass. Here's the proof. The units of mass is grams. The units of molar mass is grams per mole. Grams cancels. We're left with moles. Moles is moles. So I'm going to replace N in the ideal gas law with that right there. PV equals NRT. And I'm going to move molar mass here and PV down there. So molar mass is in the uh, sorry numerator of the left side of the equation. P and V are in the denominator. Well, what's mass over volume? Density. Density. Oh my God. So, this long thing is in there. Okay? So, we can just say dr, d for density, rt over p. That's it right there. Okay. Well, if that's the case, now we've got density right there. We got everything we needed. Are we done with the problem? No. We've got the molar mass. What else do we need? So what was the empirical formula mass? About 14. What's 42 divided by 14, you quick math people? So that so-called factor is 3. So the molecular formula is C3H6. So cool, huh? Rahul, you had a question. Uh, yeah. It was, um, so you know when you converted the mass over. Yeah. Yep, right here. Yeah, and then one, like, the previous 
problem? You like divided by RT to make it like you know right there, yeah, you like divided by P V and then you move the mole on that. Oh, like, from here you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm simply rearranging a few things so that you would see that density is included in there. You might not, if you look at this, do you see density? Not really, right? Because you think grams over, over volume or mass over volume. But if I rearrange it, and algebraically, we didn't break any laws, we're good. There's density. So that's this, that's, that's the longer explanation of how I got there. If I just showed you that, you might not have gotten it. I wanted to show you the proof. That's all. Okay, you guys, we can do some problems now because the next problems are just stoic. Oh, this one's cool. Has anybody ever been in a car accident and the airbag blew? <laughs> Has that happened to you, Arian? Yeah. Oh, have you ever seen the airbag, how big it is? Yes. It's huge, right? It's, it's 70 liters. I think I thought. That's a massive. You heard it? Like, and the airbag blew? I don't remember seeing, but I remember my parents talking about it. Oh, you were really young? Yeah. You, have, you have experienced it? Were you injured? No. Were you in the back seat? Yeah. Yeah, that's why little kids aren't supposed to ride in the front seat. Because it's 70 liters. It's huge. But you guys, how do they do it? They start with a tiny amount of a solid. Here's our model of a solid. It doesn't take up much volume. But when it turns to a gas, and it's a three to two stoic relationship. That means for every two of these, you get three <laughs> gas molecules and they're going like that. It fills up the balloon really quickly and really uh, to a big volume. So this stuff is called sodium azide. Its real name is obviously sodium nitride. It's just familiarly called azide. So the question is, oh, this is a stoic geometry problem. What's the source of the gas in this reaction? Uh, sodium azide? No, that's the solid. I mean, nitrogen. Just nitrogen gas. So if I tell you 70 liters, what's room conditions? What's the temperature? 20, I mean, zero. zero. I mean, 275. 25C, but really in Kelvin. 298. 298. <laughs> and what's the pressure? One atmosphere. One atmosphere. So apparently this car is at sea level. So at sea level, at room temperature, it's a nice warm place, 25 degrees or 298, what is the number of moles? That's what this question's asking. You need to find this right here, you guys, the number of moles at non-standard conditions. Once you find that, what do you need? You found the number of moles of this. That, does that tell you this? What do you have to do? Yeah, what is that? What do we use? The molar ratio, three nitrogens to two sodium azide. We want to end up with sodium azide in the numerator. So that's got to go on top in the ratio, two sodium azides over three nitrogen gases. Okay, this is gas stoichiometry. By the way, I have the answer right here. PV equals NRT, we need the number of moles of nitrogen gas. That's the only gas in this problem. Plug in all your data. There's our moles of nitrogen. We're right here. Now we're going to compare stoichiometrically the moles of, of nitrogen to sodium azide. So here's our moles of nitrogen. That's what we got. Nitrogen goes in the denominator. We want sodium azide in the numerator. That's got to be the answer. So it goes in the top two to three, right from the balanced equation. Oh gosh, don't forget to balance the equation. Plug, chug, count sig figs, three here, three here. Yep, we're all happy. All the same stuff we've been doing all year. And now we can add another branch to our molar highway. And that brings us to uh, uh, Dalton and Graham, so we're going to stop here. <laughs>